So welcome to the Women in Cyber series. I'm virtually here, of course, with my special guest, Katie Arrington, Chief Information Security Officer for the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. So welcome, Katie. I'm so happy to have you here. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the virtual environment. It is, uh, you know, if I had my cup of coffee, we could clink. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, so great. So we're going to be here for the audience today just talking about your role, um, what you're currently doing now, talking about how you got your start in cybersecurity. And really, it's uh, the platform here is for women to, you know, share their stories about uh, their leadership role and inspire other women to come into cybersecurity. Awesome. So let's get started. And I'll have you introduce yourself and tell the audience about your current role and what you're doing. So I am the uh, Chief Information Security Officer for the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. And what that really means is I am the uh, Miss Lord, the Undersecretary of Defense for ANS, Acquisition and Sustainment, um, the Honorable Ellen Lord, uh, is the individual in the department who is over all of the acquisition, the buy. So the Department of Defense budget is about $750 billion a year. Um, Ms. Lord has the oversight and the authority over $350 billion a year. So it's a big deal. Um, my job is to implement cyber um, throughout that life cycle. So I'm over the cyber security of the weapon systems defense critical infrastructure, and the defense industrial base. So from cradle to grave and all that lives in the middle, I'm the one in charge with figuring out how we implement, um, execute, we make cybersecurity auditable, repeatable, scalable, so that, it, that it's across the, the life cycle. And, and when we say life cycle, it's when a requirement is created um, long before uh, uh, hypersonics was ever a thing, it was a requirement and making sure you have cybersecurity from there till when we retire and decommission a weapon system. So a lot. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's a it's, lot. It's a, it's, it's a hefty lift. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much for explaining that because mm -hmm. I know our audience uh, will appreciate that as I do. And yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it, it's definitely, um, I mean, we're living in obviously a very uh, interesting time right now with the pandemic. Um, so talking about that, what, what um, how, you know, we talked uh, as we were preparing for this mm -hmm. about how, how the pandemic really didn't, you didn't skip a beat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you actually just went uh, kind of on high alert. So talk to us about, um, you know, what that looked like when COVID hit and, and, you know, any potential work from home situation for you, which I know wasn't, wasn't a factor. So we'll remember um, days or times in our lives. I can clearly remember uh, the morning of 9-11. I actually was in, in that area um, where you're at now. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you will remember where you were and the things that happened around you. And we had been watching um, it build, right? Uh, in, in the department, we had seen our industrial base um, starting to, to get ill as it were getting sick and, and the mm -hmm. capacity. Um, there were some amazing days in the very start of the pandemic that will live in infamy in my mind. Um, first was um, being uh, on the ground here in the department and I was tasked out to the FEMA task force for supply chain to help secure the supply chain of PPE. But right before that, um, the uh, the day before I actually showed up at FEMA's doorstep, uh, we in the department were working through a memo with DHS CISA on making the DIB, Defense Industrial Base, those 300,000 companies in the United States, mission essential. And it was this flurry of, of activity um, and the uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisition uh, named by uh, Honorable Kevin Fahey. Um, I will never forget writing that memo, right? And, and knowing the right people to communicate to, to make sure that, that we kept the, the national defense operational when we had gone through something that was unprecedented, you know, we were shutting down and what does that really mean? So since the pandemic, um, we, I'm uh, one of those mission essentials. Um, many of us are, uh, we haven't missed a beat. Uh, we have been uh, teleworking in, in a lot of capacity. Um, we have expanded, that was a four letter word 
in Department of Defense prior. You did not telework. There really wasn't anything that you shouldn't be doing in the building. We have definitely changed a culture a narrative uh, that we now allow telework, that we have um, we had the security protocols before, we just didn't have them on so many devices, but we have expanded. I, I commend uh, DISA and CIO, uh, they, uh, the Chief Information Officer and Office in the Department of Defense and DISA, the Defense Information Sec um, Systems Agency, I remember DISA's name, we expanded. I mean, it, unbelievable. Uh, so we're we're in this environment. Um, I'm enjoying it because a uh, the commute is a lot better driving into work. <laughs> right. But but more yes. importantly, it's on. You know, when security comes into effect, um, it's really been that thing, right? You think about what 9/11 did, right? Um, it changed. It wasn't that terrorist events didn't happen before then, and we didn't understand them. Uh, we had had, uh, you know, aeronautics used and, and aviation used as terrorist events. I mean, remember Lockerbie? Um, it, tremendous. But it wasn't and happened until on our shores, in our, our home turf, that we literally changed the game overnight. Right. The U.S. made a decision that they were shutting down their air airspace and the world shut down. And when we decided to open back up again, it was a new standard. You had to have an ID that was validated. Um, and, and you know, countries that didn't have validation capability like Somalia, we we're saying, uh, no, you can't get on a plane. I think of 9-11 and then I think of our lockdown, right, and pandemic, and they're very much alike. We had been working on, on cybersecurity uh, for a minute now here in the department. It's a big thing. But the pandemic brought it to that heightened point, and we said, you know what, we've been talking about this, but this is now we are making uh, cybersecurity foundational to acquisition, and it's a go, no-go decision. Um, the pandemic turn that light switch. So it's a new day. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited that we get to have this conversation about what it really means to be a, a CISO, right? And why everybody is their own CISO. You know, you are only as valuable as your own IP. What you are as as in, uh, you know, as a woman in industry, your intellect, your capability, it's your own IP. And you have to really stop and think of how do I, I protect what I've invested in my, my knowledge, my capability, my, my uh, experiences, um, the open internet exploits it. So we, we have to get risk reduction strategies to protect our own IP and our companies. And I couldn't, Timing is everything in life. It, it's it's an amazing opportunity. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, the way you just said it, it makes everybody can turn themselves into a CISO, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you mentioned about just those points in time in life where you remember. And I mm -hmm. remember exactly where I was on 9-11. And on the, in the pandemic, I mean, from a civilian standpoint, I actually was in Miami with some friends. And it was like almost like you could just see, you know, like and imagine everything shutting down, like mm -hmm. caving in. And I, we were scrambling to get home. And I didn't even know if I was going to be able to get a, a cab from San Francisco Airport because BART shut down. And I just I'll never forget that. And, you know, so but I do think, too, that um, that with these challenging times like 9-11, you said overnight when the when the airspace opened up, the country opened up again you had new measures in place. There's innovation comes with these challenging times. And mm -hmm. I, I really believe that that's where we're into another phase of innovation. You can see it everywhere. Even yep. just as, as we were talking before about, you know, outdoor dining. I mean, cities and, and streets that would not allow, you know, outdoor dining, now they're building massive structures up to support that. And so in a, in a moment of levity, I'll say the moment that they let, um, I, they, I, there is, this is truly a moment of levity. If you go on to my, uh, LinkedIn or my Facebook, because I'm out there, um, it's at the start of the pandemic and I had, I didn't have cable at the start of the pandemic. I had only internet and I wanted cable because I was there. Um, 
And it was this, I, I did it because I, there was a, I, I, I went on and I said, you know, it's been a long day. I'm pretty lonely here in my apartment. It, it had, and the thing that brought me joy is that there was this box that had been delivered and that, you know, the world didn't know what the box meant to me, but I went down and what was more important was the flyer at my apartment complex in the lobby that the local sports pub that I go to was actually, um, it was uh, delivery of beer wine, beer and wine with my pizza, right? And I was like, you don't know. Like <laughs> that changed the pandemic for me, right? It right, was right. how we can move things around. I mean, it's a, it's a moment of levity and I appreciate right. anybody that has a drug or alcohol problem, but that to me right. was just, wow, how, how we can change things, right? You couldn't walk right. on the streets of Washington, D.C. holding an open container, but you can right. deliver it during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, because, well, in San Francisco, before I left, you know, the, the uh, restaurants start, and bars started um, providing mixed drinks. Yeah. And there was a kind of a dive bar. I lived down by the water, and there was a dive bar across the street from me. And, and I knew things were going to be okay when I looked out the window and I saw the line down the street oh, of them getting their to-go <laughs> cups. I'm like, okay, okay, we're, we're going to be okay. <laughs> well, it's so, so you, you think about that, right? And, and as we have evolved as human beings, um, it's it's only in the times that we really are pushed to the brink that of of bad things that we really evolve and you know the catalyst to change generally isn't positive. It's a negative effect that makes that catalyst move. Um, okay. And you have to take it. You know you always have to make lemonade, right? The pandemic is a lemon, no doubt for everybody. Um, the lemonade that we're making out of it is. That we're pushing the boundaries of what we can do, and um, mm -hmm. the companies. I mean, you mentioned the restaurants. Um, you know, the online ordering and Uber Eats and DoorDash and all right. of those. It's, you know, if it wasn't for cyber in the pandemic, and understanding how we could use that technology to our advantage. Um, imagine what our kids, we were talking about it before we, we, we started this, this session, um, education for our children. If we didn't have cyber, where would they be? Uh, a year of, of no school? That's right, um, absolutely. Healthcare, if you didn't have cyber, um, how would the, the the massive amounts of people that have had telehealth and you know doctors able to, to reach out, or even in the pandemic in the, the most, uh, you know, worst part of the pandemic. Um, I lost uh, uh, several family members at the start of it that were elderly, actually in New York. Um, but I, I think about the capability that cyber created in those, those moments where loved ones were leaving this earth. Um, and they had the capability, even though they were in, in isolation, to communicate with their family right. members via FaceTime. It's we have to look at the the sides of it's a horrible pandemic, but wow, what it's done That's and right. and what it's done. Right. And we have to take that and learn, you know, it, we mentioning the, the the pandemic and the the after effects. Right. So it's great that we've had education that we can have in an environment where our children can continue to learn. Um, but the uh, the offset of that, the bad side is the social skills that how are we going to bridge that gap? And we need to really be cognizant about that and think, you know, how can we take the lemonade and make sure that we learn from it? We learn the risk reduction strategies around it so we don't have it happen again, but we learn and we implement um, ways to get around it in the future. I just, it's an amazing time to be alive because I can't imagine our world in 10 years from now. That's right. That's right. And, you know, it's interesting because we've done a lot of things around restaurants and I, I didn't really think about it this way until you just said it, but, um, you know, we put all the focus on food and restaurants because it was a big demand for us as, you know, humans to go out and socialize. But, we, we do need to find a way that if we have this pandemic and kids are stuck inside and you've got a homeschool that you can, we have to somehow work around that, right? And figure out a way for to get them socially inter, inter you know, interact with each other so that we don't have, um, you know, this challenge. And it'll be interesting, obviously, to see where everything goes um, in the next 10 years. It, to, sure. Well, you, so you remember, right? When we had, um, so here's how I, I, I put things in context. 9-11, I had a flip phone. 
I remember my my razor flip phone in 9-11. And for all of the, so I'm soon to be the big 5-0 in a couple of weeks. Um, but I remember that, you know, having to frantically type, you know, the number uh, one, three times to, you know, put the letter C in. <laughs> right. um, oh and my you think gosh, yes. That was then. And think of where we are I now. Know. I it's know. like night and day. Yeah. And as for all of us, right, in, in the CISO community or, you know, and I go back to that whole thing of your your own IP, when, when the magic stones came along, we really didn't think about the risk of using these, right? right. And, and right. What that, you know, God love them, those user agreements, right? What we, <laughs> what we gave away, um, you know, we've learned a lot. And now people actually read them. They're like, oh, wait a minute. I don't know that I want to do that. Right. I think with, with the pandemic, where we'll be in 10 years from now, we'll be a, a completely different world altogether. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, okay, so let's, let's talk about how you got your start in cybersecurity. I know it's a very interesting story and I know the audience would love to hear about it. So tell us, so, tell us about that. <laughs> I, and I, I'm sorry. So no kidding. Um, I am, uh, probably one of the most prolific um, learners. Uh, I was graduated high school. I went to college right out to school, and I met my uh, my first husband um, when I was on Christmas break in my sophomore year, and he was in, uh, at Fort Drum, New York. I, we met. Um, I ended up becoming a military wife, and having to stop and start my education every two years as we were moving, right, as, as an enlisted. Right. Um, I have taken accounting 101 nine times. And it's not because I failed it. It's because every time we moved, I had to go back and start all over again. That my, you know, back in the 80s, you couldn't take your, you know, the common core classes. So, right. I went several years. I I went to technical and community colleges in and and universities in New York, Hawaii, Illinois, and Washington State. You imagine that. Um, so all of that time, um, I never actually earned a college degree. So first and foremost, I have more college credits than my sister, who's a doctor, but I have no degree. Um, my major studies was always about politics and, and political science. Um, so prior, um, I had done, um, uh, I've had a very fun career. I've had many, many different iterations of it because I think that's what makes a good CISO, right? I've owned my own business. I have worked for people. I have written policy. But how I got started into cyber was I had owned my own land development company in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I was building subdivisions and, and, and loving every minute of it. Um, okay. I was building a building for a defense contractor. Um, it, the start of the recession um, was coming. And I said, uh, you know, my, I, I, knew that I wouldn't be able to sustain my the, the current company that I had um, and winding it down. And they asked, you know, we had this um, this this role that we think you'd be amazing at. Um, you're a very good networker and you get things. Would you be interested? And I absolutely I was, you know, early 30s, uh, you know, couple of kids. Why not? Um, and I, I needed, I needed to, to, prov to provide, I was divorced. I needed to provide a uh, livelihood for myself and my children. Um, I went in and the, the large uh, SI system integrator in the department, um, I went in the first day, um, I was put on a cyber capture management team. I listened to a day of sitting in a room where everybody was speaking in acronyms and I'm not kidding, I wrote every acronym down, I absorbed. On the way home, I picked up information uh, networking for dummies, cybersecurity for dummies, and I immersed myself. And literally any online class I could take, any book I could read, anybody I could communicate with, and I started my path into cyber. And uh, 
uh, my son was, you know, early teens, gosh, I think about it. And we learned to code together. Wow. <laughs> and I took that um, capability and, and, you know, started really getting, realizing that cybersecurity and information technology and information networking um, was really where my passion lied. Um, and I went from that large business to a small uh, service disabled veteran owned small business. Then I started my own non-traditional. And as I went through that, I really, cyber just became this thing for me that it, and um, I became impassioned about it um, and realized how interconnected we were and actually ran for office um, to correct cyber policy. Um, and, you know, on my state, uh, I did a lot in South Carolina as he cyber. I changed policy and legislation. Um, and when I ran for Congress, I ran on a platform of understanding cyber. Um, I obviously lost my, my congressional bid um, and the department, as soon as they were like, hey, we could really use you to come in here. We needed, they brought me in to the department to be a, a change agent, right? That they, mm -hmm. I came into the Department of Defense as a highly qualified expert on cyber for, and the, the rationale when I came in was tell us what we're doing that we need to do differently. And if you don't know anything about the CMMC, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, take a moment and Google it. Um, you'll learn a lot. Uh, but that was really the, the, the career transition. Starting was out of uh, necessity. Like I said, the catalyst, like it's never, mm -hmm. a, it, to me, it just seems like there's always a, a negative force in how you change it. You know, I could have sat around and cried in my, uh, my oatmeal about the fact that my business was not going to be around versus look at the new opportunity and, you know, working on the, my skill set and my experience to fix a problem for a company was not, you know, it wasn't the same ilk, but man, did it, it did it ever work out. So right. that's how I started. That's, that's amazing. You know, mm -hmm. it's interesting. I was thinking back many moons ago, many, many years ago when I started, when I got into information technology, I actually have a um, maternal and child health degree from Berkeley. And I uh, went and worked for the WIC program for three years when I first got out of college. And I worked in the, you know, in, in South Central LA for three years. And I finally, you know, I, I, I tried to save the world for three years. It was a cha very challenging job. And I decided that I needed to make a change and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I mean, it was a college graduate. This is what I'd studied. And so I ended up, I can't believe looking back on this and I haven't really admitted this to many people, but I took a temp job and the temp job, they kind of, you know, weren't, didn't really want to hire me because um, I couldn't type fast enough. Mm -hmm. And, but anyway, I ended up going to Ernst and Young or Arthur Young at the time. And I was an executive assistant to one of the partners there. And I just remember walking, seeing these people walking really fast paced down the hall. And I'm like, where are they going? Where are they like all these people going? Oh, they're doing interviews. I'm like, what are they interviewing? What, what? So anyway, turns out it was the IT group. It was the information technology group, and these people were running around doing anal needs analysis interviews. And I said, I have to, I need to do that. I don't know what that is, but I need to do that. So I found the partner and I said, Terry, please. I, I, he's, he's like, okay, like, you don't know. I, I, don't, I said, I don't have any computer technology background, but I will go to school to do it. So I went to UCLA, I took mm -hmm. night classes, and I studied up. I learned how to, they, they selected me out of, and I'd already been out of college. This is my fourth year out of college. They put me in this, um, with the new college graduates and in their training, basic training class for three months. And I went to, lived in Chicago or actually in Wisconsin for, for three months. And they taught me everything I knew. I was a COBOL programmer. I did all these things. And Since I, I had known is that same thing, like if I had known what COBOL could be doing for right. me, finding like, oh, come on. I didn't. So anyway, that, I mean, it's just so interesting how one path and, and, but you, you know, I just followed my passion and I, I loved it and I've been in it ever since. So, and I've done so many different things, which has been amazing, you know? Well um, on that. So that why I shook my head and um, when uh, the reason my, and I'm going to go down the personal side. Um, <laughs> so my son, uh, Christian, bless his heart. Uh, he is almost 30 years old. <sighs> Um, 
his I father was in desert. Yeah, his father was in Desert Storm, and when he came home, I I joke around, but literally, I think I got pregnant on the tarmac. It, it just it, <laughs> we were. But um, as an offset of that, my son was born with um, uh, genetic abnormalities. Uh, he didn't have soft spots, so imagine I'm 20 years old. I have a brand new baby in living in Fort Drum, New York. Um, six weeks old. I turned 21, uh, you know, a couple of weeks after his birth and uh, he didn't stop screaming. The, he just cried and cried and cried. And at the six week appointment, I went into, uh, well, into Fort Drum and an amazing doctor, Dr. Brown, she is she was a young captain or lieutenant at the time, um, took one look at my son and said, there is something wrong. And within two or three hours, I was on a medevac flight going to Walter Reed with my son. He was born without soft spots, a severe case of craniosynostosis, um, which his brain was being crushed by his own skull. Wow. Six months in Walter Reed, um, he was blind and deaf for, for a while because of the surgery and the trauma. But the, the catalyst, right? You make lemonade uh, out of it. Um, when I got back, um, I had been in school and waitressing to, while my, my husband was a military member and I was continuing my education, I came back to put my son in daycare. Um, and they said, we don't have daycare for him. He's special needs. Um, and that was a catalyst that they said, I'm like, okay, well, what do I need to do to, to do this? Um, I ended up becoming and owning a daycare in my home for special needs children. I went through mm -hmm. all that training, right, which was mm -hmm. nothing of what I was went to school for. Right. Politics was my thing. And um, through that, um, I ran daycares on my out of my military home and ended up helping write the first Army regulation I knew about, which was AR 608-10, which is the Army regulation on child care, health, and human development. Oh, and that was when I first started my oh, my first small business back in the day. But that led me to work with the USDA program, and mm -hmm. it's it's that career progression. But you it's you never yeah. take an opportunity, the temp thing for you, right? It's don't ever look at something in your career as a block. How can you build upon it? And there's there is no shame in in temps. I, I think it's a really opportune time in your career, right? If you have that, to figure out what you want to be when you grow up. I mean, right. we put so much earnest that when you graduate high school, you should know what you want to be. I'm almost right. fifty, and I'm just figuring out what I am and what I want to do. Just we we put so much on. Um, people that, you know, change careers that you should be, you should be fluid. And the person you yeah. were at 20, is it the person you are now? I know Probably it's exactly not. right. Yeah. And it's interesting because my daughter, you know, is, is, I think this is a really good conversation for the audience for, for women who um, are looking to get into cyber or any type of role, you know, leadership role or advancing out of college anywhere. And we have these, this mindset about certain things, right? And I've done so many different things in my career. Like I'm, I'm the more, I'm the most authentic I've ever been in my entire life right now. And I, 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 I you know, look at all that, all the things that I did, all the different things that I did, but you do have a mindset about doing things a certain way. And I remember my, my daughter, uh, Mackenzie, she graduated college and this was like five, five, six years ago. And she comes to me and I'm like, you have to have a job when you graduate, you know, this is it. Now my other daughter had a really horrific near fatal car accident. And, mm -hmm. but my older daughter, to her credit, before she took off on her trip to Europe, she said, okay, mom, I, I signed on the dotted line. I got a job. I'm like, awesome. So she goes to get a job. Six months later, the job, the company folds mm -hmm. and she is supposed to be looking for a job. And I'm like, you need to be doing this full time. What, you know, you, oh, mom, it's going to be okay. And so anyway, <laughs> long story short, and she's like, she got six weeks severance, which is amazing because like, I don't know, that was awesome. But for her, it was like a gold mine. She mm -hmm. struck, it, struck it rich. So she was doing on these road trips. And finally she comes to me, she goes, okay, I, mom, can, do you want to have lunch today? I'm like, sure. This was in San Francisco. And so we meet, she goes, I just had a job interview. I said, oh, what's it for? She says, oh, it's this really big company, really great, but it's a contract job and everything was going good. And then she said contract. And I was like, no way, no way. You're not yeah. doing a contract job. And she just looked at me and she said, mom, not, and this was during the time nobody could get a job. And it was like, yeah. you know, five years ago, it was a real hard time, right? Economy. And she said, mom, I am doing this. I, none of my friends have a job. 
they want to offer me this job. I'm going to do this. And I thought, you know what, who am I to say what, how, how, and what, you know? So long story short is she's five years later through that position. She's got an amazing job. She makes six figures and she works at Visa in the marketing department. And you know what? It's like, you got to, you got to follow your heart. You got to, you know, and you got to take that opportunity when you think it's right. And you got to listen to your inner voice, right? That's, and for women, definitely, we get a lot of conflicting messages, right? That we, your inner voice isn't necessarily the voice you should listen to. And she absolutely is the one you should be listening to. And we, we tend to, because we are women, right? And men, women being what we are, right? You can't help what our, our past is and how we've gotten to right. this point. Right. We are the, the maternal side. And you do have those instincts that, you know, you put yourself behind. And whether it be your children, whether it be your spouse, partner, um, you know, the needs of others in your environment, right? We, we tend to... And it's that fine line where you're just like, yeah, no, I'm going to take a risk on me on this one. And it's okay. I applaud your daughter um, for being that young and that assertive to know herself, but also as your mom, the mom, right? When you have to sit back and let your children's get their feet under them, whoosh, it's a whole new game. It is. And it is. It's, it's, you look at the strong women leaders that are out there. And how they have empowered empowered women that work with them to elevate them is a lot of what you see as a mom, right? You want your children to look, at, for me, right? I, mm-hmm. I can only speak for myself. I'm the, the mom of, of three and the grandmother of four. I look at that the environment that I created for them to be successful is a lot of the same way I lead people, right? I believe that a good leader is about empowering those around you to elevate up. The best leaders, their 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 uh, companies, their markets, their programs function flawlessly in their absence because they have empowered people to move around. And mm-hmm. you think about it as mom, like your job. That's what you do. You empower the, the the ones around you to be successful. That's that's the key, right? And that listen is, to your inner voice. That's ex- exactly right. So um, tell us who inspires you. Okay, so it really obscure people um, that you generally wouldn't think inspire me because they they have the fortitude that no matter how much you you. They, they get put down, they get back up again, right? So that always has been um, that, that re-emergence of big things that have gone wrong in their lives and they've just popped right back up. Um, oddly enough, um, uh, Jimmy Carter, President Carter. Uh, he, I look at Jimmy Carter's life and where he's been. And even when people have said no, he tends to elevate himself up, right? He just, it's about the greater good and he comes around. So obscure, you would never think, you know, (laughs) politics aside, but I I look at someone that really did something. um, We forget about the hostage situation and that he was the president at that time. And they were actually released purposefully after the next president was elected. Right. That did never stop him. It was about the mission. And he was always a humanitarian. He kept core to who he was. He's, you know, stood on the 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 you know humanitarian effort. He created Habitat for Humanity, he and, and his wife. I, I look at at that him as really one of them um strong leaders. Then I I look at Liz Cheney, right? I, she really, I love that woman to death. I think that she is one of those, you know, she speaks um, softly, articulately, carries a big stick, comes from a very diverse background and really is a change agent that doesn't get a lot of publicity. She's just kind of, Liz Cheney has been doing amazing things. Hmm. It's just, you know, so I, I look at my, those two, um, and then there's a person here in the Pentagon. Um, her name is Nikki Abbott, and it's N I K K I E or E E. Um, she was the is um, our mission engineer lead um, for A and S right now. But I met her eight years ago, 
and she changed uh, my entire outlook on uh, working on network architecture. Um, we were sitting in the army. Uh, we had a, back then it was called the Win T. It was the SATCOM co communications. And Nikki sat in a room full of brilliant engineers. And we were the only two women in the room. And she said, you, you all are making the greatest mistake. You are looking at the world as it is, not as it could be. And that like just like rocked me to the core because you tend to think this is the the box that I've been given, right? And this is what I have to do. And she said, no, absolutely. You've got to look at it completely different. I look at those people and their moments of impact in my life, you know, from Jimmy Carter to Liz Cheney to Nikki Abbott, completely off the wall. None of them have the same background. Nikki Abbott is an immigrant. Um, you know, just it, it, for, uh, for she became a naturalized U.S. citizen. Um, Liz Cheney. I mean, we all know the Cheney family. You look at Jimmy Carter, and not a one of them have a common linkage. But they all really have. They, they're so in tune with who they are that they've been able to say. It's bigger than me. These are the things, and don't take the world for what it is. Make it what you need it to be. That is really interesting, and I have to read up on Liz Cheney because I don't know much about her. Dick Cheney's um, daughter, um, congressman yeah, from no. Wyoming. Um, yeah, she yeah. is the current um, uh, Republican House Caucus leader. Uh, she is she is a change agent. Oh, good. Yeah, I, I was just when you were talking, I was thinking back on you know the people in my life that have said things that have went wow, you know, and and uh, they they talk they speak to you, mm -hmm. and uh, that that's fantastic. And I do think that it's important to uh, you know create the world that you want to to live in, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, not just take what you have it just as face value. You've got to you've got to think. I always tell my daughters, shoot for the stars, not the horizon. It, it, and uh, if you don't, you will never get anywhere. It's, you've got to have a life strategy, you know, whether it be, you know, I want, my strategy is I, I want to retire at blank, or you've got to set goals for yourself and you've got to figure out, you know, the ends, the ways and the means of strategy. You've got to have a mode to get you there. You got to have an objective of where you want to go and you've got to figure out where you are to start so you can get to there. Yes, absolutely. And it, it's it, that, it, along with the fact that you should, in career-wise, um, my mentor uh, is Mr. Kevin Fahey, um, the the Honorable Kevin Fahey. I've uh, been a career mentor for, um, gosh, longer than I want to admit. Um, he has a core in him. He's like, you should never stay at any one position in leadership longer than a five-year cycle. First year, you're figuring out what, what it is you do. Second year, you figure out what it is you want to change. Third year, you start implementing change. And in the third year, you should start looking at someone else to come and be you because you, you, you need to see the world from a different lens. Mm -hmm. And that really, it's like, oh, I look at my, my career now in, in three to five year segments. What, yeah. what am I going to do? And, and that's really what it's been, three to five mm -hmm. year segments. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Actually, you've had a lot of people, a lot of CISOs um, come through with C on CISO Street. And the platform really, this site is for, you know, helping people for, with branding and promoting themselves and, you know, give speaking opportunities and things like that. And a lot of them have used it as a platform to go on to the next job, um, you know, just as a put their voice out there. So it is interesting to see that time frame. And I, I see it. It's three, three to five. <laughs> and, and it's good. It gives your, and that's another thing is, you know, invest in yourself, your own happiness has such your own sense of self-worth, your own sense of accomplishment really has value, right? You've got to give your soul nourishment. And we spend, you know, I love what I do. I, I don't look at it as, as work. I look at it as this is my passion. Right. I'm, clear, 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 that comes across loud and clear. That's yeah, great. It's, it's what I love to do. And I love to problem solve, right? So if you don't go to work every day, um, and, and if you go to work every day, you're doing it wrong, right? If you go to do your job, like this is my job, and you, you, you give yourself that, oh, I, I did something. If you're in a position today that you don't feel that way, or you're not empowered to lead or to make decisions, or you're not being cultivated to get there, 
I, I know it's risky, right? But listen to the inner self. Figure out, you know, you, where it is you think you belong. And don't be afraid to, uh, to move fields because CISOs, we are generally not, you know, cyber. My problem solving skills are essential. My networking skills are essential. Relationship creation, strategy, understanding economics and finance, the capability to architect a team, right? That's CISO, right? That's, we're not just cyber people. It's all of that put together because you can't look at as as information security or security in a company and without understanding all those different dynamic pieces and how you put those together is what makes a well-rounded CISO. Uh, that, at least in my my experience, the ones that I've come across, um, and I work with a lot of them, uh, the really successful ones are, they're not solely dedicated to one thing. They've had this broad career swath uh, that's brought them to the place of, of where they are today. Very good. So what what is what do you think is the biggest lesson that you've learned in your career? And you sort of touched on it now, but I'm just wondering if there's any one particular thing that you can look at as the biggest lesson that you've learned. My mentor said it in his hearing when he was confirmed. I'd like to fail early. <laughs> if I'm going to fall, you know, if I'm going to try something, I'd rather learn quickly what I'm not doing right so that I can really learn from that and be strong in the long term and not being a failed, if, afraid of, of, of risk and failure. I think that's in every aspect of my life. And I don't know, you know, it's, a, I'm, a, I'm Katie Arrington DOD and I'm in the Pentagon filming this, but I'll tell you, I, I've learned more from my failures as a, as a woman, as a mom, as a friend, as a peer, as an employee, as a leader. Um, and that that's good, right? That failure is not a bad thing. It means you leaned in to do something different. The way you did it didn't work out. Don't do that way again. Um, the, the character of a woman is is never defined by the, the moments that we're on our greatest um, high. It's how we actually function in the lowest low that that gives us that capability to get up. So no, yeah. most forgive yourself. It's okay. Make mistakes. Make mistakes. You're yeah. only going to learn from them. That's absolutely right. Yeah. And I, um, I had the fort good fortune to work for a boss. I mean, he's definitely Israeli ex-intelligence. Um, he's a hard charging guy, but I have learned a lot from him. And he's always said he has two strategies. Well, he has two stains. And, and, and if we're in a meeting, he knows I know them. He'll look at me and I'm like, hope is not a strategy and the truth will set you free. Oh my gosh, and it sounds like my boss, Kevin Faith. <laughs> like, like, hope is not a strategy. Now, prayer right. is, but hope is not a strategy. <laughs> it's right. That's it's, right. But he also encourages us to try things. And, and mm -hmm. if you fail, you fail, but you give it your all and, you know, you go for it. And so I, I feel like, you know, having somebody that allows you to do that is also really important too. But I agree with you 100%. Fail early so that you can take that and and run with it you know and we we tend as women that failure is something we for a guy for men um just culturally um to make a mistake is okay right eh. um girl growing up you know you make a mistake it's like oh my gosh and it's as women we have to remember right that the, the capability of leaning in and risk. And we tend to be around, and, and I will say this, I, I, I don't like to make generalizations, but for women, we tend to be our own worst enemies, right? If, if you see so a true. female who is successful, right? That almost like, hmm, what is it that she's doing that's, that has her in that environment? And I don't agree with everybody, but look at those, those identifiers of, of what it is and, the, the other thing that I'd, I'd, you need to empower each other and look at your wake, right? Your wake, what you leave mm -hmm. behind you. If your personal and professional wake is incredibly turbulent, if there's a lot of, you know, uh, what wake on a boat, right? When right. you really, when a boat is at its highest performance and it's going across the water, it almost glides and the path behind it, it looks like a whale's tail. It's symmetrical, it's even, it's constant. 
if the weight behind you in your life is all akimbo, no, you're not focusing and you're not at your highest performance. So you should be looking and mindful of what it is behind you that happened to ensure the performance and mm -hmm. those mistakes, those risks, those things. Make sure you're using them and, and narrowing in and high, performing at your highest capability. That is a fantastic analogy. And uh, we're almost up to the hour here and it's gone by so fast. There's so many more things to talk about, but let's just end this with talking about what you do when you're not in cyber mode, <laughs> which sounds like most of the time you're, especially in these days with the pandemic um, uh, um, uh, upon us, not much time for free um, time, but. My free time. All right. So I, I've, <laughs> I'm, I am trying to learn to knit, oh, right? Okay. Um, my struggle is that I have very bad vision and I constantly have to lift my glasses up. So I'm trying to learn to knit um, because I, I figure I've got to leave something. Um, <laughs> and I am still um, a crazy reader. Mm -hmm. I still, as much as the world has gone on, I still pummel through a book a week, but I have really focused in on things that are not work-related that take mm -hmm. my brain away and remind me of um, things outside of that. So reading, um, family is always there. You, 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 grandchildren love those little suckers. Um, right. <laughs> knitting. I just, I remember my grandmother knitting and that, that repetition, that concentration, right. the softness of the yarn on your fingertips, it's, it's soothing. It's yeah. relaxing. And when I leave and, and I see a lot of bad, right? That's I'm the chief information security officer for uh, all of weapon systems. And I, I see a lot of that. Right. To go to sleep at night, because you do, you stay up, you're like, oh my gosh, I got to do this or this. That repetition is really calming. Hmm very calming. Yeah. My, my daughters taught me how to, uh, to knit. And this was back when they were little girls and I was divorced and, um, mm -hmm. we would sit at, in, in the living room and they would teach me how, and they would come, mommy, mommy, let's, let's get our knitting out. I'm like, oh my, I cannot believe I'm knitting, but it was, it was so fun too, just to hear the needles click. And, um, so I used to do it on my finger. My sisters and I oh. used to do the, you know, on your finger. Right. Uh, but right. now it's it's actually with the things. And by, mind you, I could never take anything I've created outside of this sphere <laughs> because it really is hideous. What, what, um, what have you made? What have you made? Um, lots of potholders. Oh, yeah. Lots. <laughs> <laughs> I made a potholder too. That was the first thing I made. I think it's probably the I, only thing I made. <laughs> I have been working on an Angora scarf uh, for oh, myself yeah. for, for quite a bit of time. Uh -huh. um, and it's still, it keeps getting pulled out because I see, you know, it's, I'm learning. I'm, I'm a learner, but that's, that's, funny. that's my, so my what, free time. What's, your, what's the latest book or your, one of your favorite books that you've read? Oh, so I am in a, a Dorothy Benton Frank. Uh, she is a, a, a woman, uh, rest her soul, uh, did a lot of books on uh, strong women characters out of South Carolina um, oh, okay. and their fiction. But I have been on a Dorothy Benton Frank uh, it, high, like it, it's good to read about where I where I live, um, you know, the context. So, yeah, her and, you know, and then you, you, you yeah, I, I, I'm that girl. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I, I started reading, this was a while ago, but it is, it is um, kind of espionage related. So you might not have wanted to read it, but um, Daniel Silva. Oh and, yeah. And um, Gabrielle Allende. And I love those books so much. And it was one of the things that I bonded with my boss. Well, I met my boss in the dog park, number mm -hmm. one. And then when he was brought brought me into this restaurant to interview me for this position, um, I, he started saying something. I said, oh, well, I read these books, you know, uh, uh, Daniel Silva books. And he goes, oh, my gosh, that's that's about what I did. And, you know, so anyway, but I, I love those books, too. <laughs> no, it's and they were before the pandemic, you know, the Tom Clancy's, you know, the, yeah. they were very much the the environment. But now that the pandemic, I really need to chill. <laughs> yeah. so it's been, exactly. It's exactly. been Dorothy Benton Franken. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate this and good luck with everything. And and, you know, in another six month time, we'll have to reconnect and uh, we'll do another another version up here, hopefully post pandemic. 
So I appreciate the time, the opportunity. Um, for those of you who have listened, thank you for entertaining, um, listening us. I feel like we're, you know, had our coffee uh, chit-chatting. Right. Um, right. My one thing that I would say, uh, please uh, test negative, stay positive, and be kind to one another, but be kind to yourself. And thank you so much. You have a wonderful day.